Good morning, it's Thursday, August the 20th. My name is Joe Haynes, I'm the preaching elder at Beacon Church, and we live on Vancouver Island in the capital city, Victoria of British Columbia. I want to welcome you to this morning's devotional. We're going to be looking at uh, the letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. That is Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And this morning will be part one. I'll finish up again uh, tomorrow with part two of this letter because there's so much here to unpack. Uh, but uh, get your Bible, please, and turn with me to Revelation chapter uh, 3, verse 7. And we'll read this, this whole letter and then pray. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. And I'm reading, of course, in the English Standard Version. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word, and I pray, Lord, the encouragement uh, to faithfulness, uh, the encouragement to love your word and to love it when others come to know your word. I pray that that encouragement will penetrate us this morning. I pray that we will be encouraged in our witness. I pray that we will be encouraged in perseverance and endurance. I pray that you will give us patience for these times that we live in. Lord, that you will give us an increased desire, an increased uh, burden for those who don't yet know your name and haven't yet discovered your love. And I pray that you will lead us to prayer. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, of the seven letters in the beginning of the book of Re Revelation, after the salutation and the greetings and the opening vision that John has, this uh, is uh, this this one letter. It's the sixth letter, and it's one of only two letters in the in the beginning of Revelation here with no words of rebuke, no kind of correction from Jesus. In other words, it's positive. It's all positive. And perhaps more than any of the other letters, uh, the message of this letter is built around the attributes of Jesus himself that are shown in the introduction in verse 7. And it, it says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. Jesus himself in this letter is the Holy True One. He is, he is the one who has the royal authority of David. And if the message of grace in this letter is shaped by, by who Jesus is, according to verse 7, then the imagery Jesus uses in this letter, and, and we're going to look at some of these things, is also neatly shaped by the history of Philadelphia itself, the history of this city. So both those things come into play. And again, it teaches us something about how we should interpret the book of Revelation. Uh, there are symbolic clues here that, that portray who Jesus is and, and flow out of his character and his office, his, his power and authority. And these are given by way of symbols here. But the truths of these things are, are very important for how we are to learn and to obey the instructions of the letter of Revelation. Secondly, there are things here that are said in Jesus' words here uh, that can only really be um, unlocked and, and and appreciated, I guess is a better word, when we understand something of the background to the city of Philadelphia. And if that's true, and that pattern we've seen before in these in these seven letters to the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we've seen that pattern before. And if that's true in these letters, 
then it's also true throughout the book of Revelation that oftentimes there are details in the symbols that could only be fully appreciated by the people who live through those times. Maybe it's better to say by uh, they could only be fully appreciated by the original audience that John has, but I think also that the fulfillment of some of these predictions that come later in the book uh, can only be really uh, appreciated by the people who live through those events as they realize how clear the predictions are um, and how, how in some of the details of the symbols. Anyway, uh, I want to make that those points just uh, that's kind of off the topic. But when we look at this letter here, uh, one of the things about the background to the city of Philadelphia that's helpful here is to learn that the ancient king of Pergamon, uh, Attalus II, uh, who founded the city of Philadelphia, he named the city Philadelphia in honor of his older brother. Uh, Philadelphus means he who loves his brother. But around the time when Jesus was uh, approximately 20 years old, uh, when uh, that same earthquake that had uh, so damaged the city of Sardis that we talked about earlier, uh, that same earthquake also destroyed the city of Philadelphia and just ruined the city. It was leveled. And uh, so the, the Roman government stepped in uh, under uh, Tiberius Caesar, and they gave such a huge amount of money to the city to rebuild, and, and the, the rebuilding was largely successful. Uh, but the city was so grateful that the population themselves, on, on their own dime, they went and built a, a temple to Caesar, to worship Caesar as God. Uh, they were so grateful. And so Caesar, in, in return, is like, you give a gift, then you get, he gives a gift, gift back, and then you give another gift, and it kind of, you know, it accelerates from there. And Caesar, in return, honored the people of this city by giving them the right to rename their city New Caesarea. Uh, new Caesarea, something in, in uh, Greek, I think it was Neo Caesarea, something like that. But New Caesarea, it's like, you know, Caesar is going to give this city the right and the honor to name themselves after him. Uh, it's kind of a, anyway, uh, uh, self serving, I think, on Caesar's part. But so the city of Philadelphia was renamed in the first century, renamed New Caesarea. And, uh, um, that that's a wonderful honor. It's they they were at that time they were zealous about worshiping Caesar. The the, the it w there was a period of time when it was a bit of a fad uh, to to uh, gather around the temple worship uh, for the temple of Caesar in, in the city of Philadelphia. But it was somewhat short lived. Uh, you know Caesar could give money to this city to help them rebuild. But Caesar couldn't do anything to protect them from the, the the frequent earthquakes that terrified them. After that great big earthquake, the population was was traumatized. Uh, so and and uh, through part of the first century, there were sometimes even daily earthquakes, daily tremors, uh, and it, it just terrified the people. People lived in fear in Philadelphia, and uh, people would run out of the city at a tremor or a small earthquake. People would run out of the city, uh, terrified of being crushed by the falling stones of the buildings. People uh, would camp outside, and the, the outside of the city of Philadelphia at this time, it's kind of famous for uh, the camps outside the city, as people who lived in the city had semi-permanent campgrounds set up outside the city because they were too afraid of, of sleeping indoors, of being inside the city walls. And wouldn't you know it, after a while, living in such fear, their gratitude to Caesar for rebuilding the city had sort of faded. Their zeal to worship Caesar as God faded away, and they slowly started calling the city Philadelphia again. The name Neo-Caesarea faded. And that background, I think, will help us to see how significant the words of Jesus are, especially at the end of this letter, when he talks about putting his name on this church, the, the name of his city on this church. Uh, so these, these believers are a church of believers who are struggling. They are weak, Jesus says, you have but little power, but they are faithful. This church at Philadelphia was a faithful church. So look again at verses 7 and 8. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, 
who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. See, verse 8, if you look at verse 8, it's related to the verse before it, related to verse 7, something like how an open door is related to a key. Because in verse 8, Jesus says he has placed an open door before this church. And notice the tensing of that, of that verb. He has placed. It's in the past, but it's still there. The door is still open, and he had put it there, opened it before. Uh, he has placed an open door before the church. And in verse 7, he describes himself as the one who has the key. First, this echoes the vision of Christ in chapter 1, verse 18, where Jesus said that, where Jesus was shown to John to have the keys. And Jesus says there, I have the keys of uh, death and Hades, power over life and death, over eternal life and death, power to raise the dead, and power to condemn the wicked to eternal punishment. So second, it's surprising then when Jesus, who has the keys of death and Hades in chapter 1, verse 18, now changes that a little bit and, and rephrases that and says, now he has, uh, what does it say in verse 7? He has the key of David. It was expected for him to say he has the keys of death and Hades. It's unexpected for him to say here, the, he has the key of David. Jesus sort of went in a different direction than we would expect here. But in verse 7, uh, it, this is a different key from chapter 1, verse 18. The key of David, uh, he, Jesus says here, it, it means he alone has the power to open and shut these doors. Uh, this, I think, is significant, and, and it's a little bit harder to understand, um, but we'll, we'll work through this. Uh, in verse 7, that phrase in verse 7 about Jesus having the key of David who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, those words aren't accidental. That's a direct quote from the Old Testament. The, the passage in the Old Testament is Isaiah 22, verse 22, which uh, is part of a strange little prophecy in the book of Isaiah. Uh, and I've never yet heard a preacher preach on that passage, but I, I'd love to. Uh, it's a strange little prophecy against a, a very important man in the city of Jerusalem, a man named Shebna. And he was sort of like a prime minister uh, or a, 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 the chief of staff, like to the president. Uh, he was a, a steward over the king's household. It meant he really was in charge of all that happened and under the king only, uh, kind of like Joseph in, in Pharaoh's Egypt. Uh, but this Shebna, uh, he was uh, apparently self-serving, apparently very proud, and building himself a tomb uh, to, to have his name and reputation memorialized, a monument to his own greatness uh, in, in the tomb that he was building, which is kind of interesting given what Jesus says here. Um, but Shebna, apparently in Isaiah chapter 22, is judged by God for his pride. We're not told exactly what it is, except it has to do with his the tomb that he's building and apparently the monument to his own legacy. But God judges Shebna. And in that passage, God judges Shebna for his pride, his self-importance. And Isaiah predicts in Isaiah 22, verse 20, that God will replace Shebna with a new steward named Eliakim. And uh, Isaiah says, in that day, God says through Isaiah rather, in that day I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe. He's saying, talking to Shebna. I will clothe him with your robe. I will bind your sash on him. Now, I, I want you to notice that, that uh, God was predicting through Isaiah that he would take something away from Shebna and give it to Eliakim. And he repeats this idea. I will take away uh, his robe, your robe, Shebna, and give it to Eliakim. I will take your sash and put it on Eliakim. I will take your authority and give it to Eliakim's hand, he says. I will commit your authority to his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. And here's the quote. He shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. That's Isaiah 20. Uh, 2 verse 22. 
So now, according to Jewish tradition, uh, Eliakim also had the power over uh, who was allowed to em- enter the temple. Part of the one one Jewish translation had this uh, had it added that he had power to open and shut the sanctuary, the holy place. So if we sort of put that together, we have a proud and powerful official being removed by God, replaced with a humble servant, and what belonged to the proud man is taken away from him and given to this humble and faithful man named Eliakim. There is so much more to say here about how Isaiah develops the idea of Eliakim, uh, God's servant here as a sort of a pointer pointing ahead to Jesus Christ. Uh, But that's uh, more than we can take time for as we, our focus here is Revelation chapter 3. But let's just keep this simple. Did you notice at the beginning of verse 8? In verse 8, Jesus repeats part of that quote from Isaiah 22, verse 22. He says in verse 8 to the church, now he's not talking about himself here, who has the key of David, who shuts and no one opens, who opens and no one shuts. Here he is saying, he's talking to the church in verse 8. He says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. Uh, He's telling the church in Philadelphia that he's put an open door in front of them, which no one's able to shut. Like God blessed Eliakim with authority. Jesus is blessing this church with the benefits of his own authority. That that idea of a, an open door is one that that is used elsewhere in the New Testament, and how it's used sheds some light on how these readers would have understood that. Uh, Paul used the imagery of an open door three times in his letters to describe missionary opportunities for for outreach for spreading the gospel. So we see that in First Corinthians sixteen nine and Second Corinthians two verse twelve and in Colossians four verse three. So by this time, when this letter was written at the around the year 95 uh, AD in the first century, an open door probably was already well understood as a term for the church's mission to preach the gospel. And Jesus says he had placed before them an open door, meaning that for some time already, they had had this effective missionary opportunity, an opportunity for gospel outreach. And this was because Philadelphia was a a gateway city to the lands beyond. When King Adelus, uh, again back to the founding of the city of Philadelphia, when King Adelus chose the location for the city, he was being strategic. The city stood at at the end of a a long valley, a gateway to the rural interior uh, of the country where the population was sort of cut off and isolated uh, from the modern world. And Adelus wanted to modernize those people, expose them to the culture known as Hellenism, that is the the culture and the language of the Greeks that was changing the world at that time of his reign. And it worked. By the year 19 AD, so uh, when Jesus was in his very, very early 20s, the, the Lydian language of the rural interior had nearly completely died out and everyone was now speaking Greek. And that was because Attalus had built the city of Philadelphia where he did. Uh, as a gateway to the rural interior. And now look at verse 8 with me, and maybe this will sort of click a little bit more. Jesus says, I know your works. Behold, I have set, set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Jesus had taken Philadelphia's strategic location and he'd used it to save souls. He had set before them an open door for gospel outreach, for missionary fruit. He'd he'd been saving souls and giving them a harvest, bearing fruit for the gospel, blessing this church's outreach. And the New American Standard Bible gives, I think, a better translation of verse 8 that shows that their fruitful outreach was a reward from Jesus for their faithful obedience. So the New American Standard Bible reads verse 8 like this. Behold, I have put you put before you an open door, which no one can shut because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. It might be the highest honor I can think of. When Jesus rewards a church that has faithfully kept believing the good news, by making their message bear fruit in their own area, in their own surrounding 
region and their own backyard. But it's also quite likely that their fruitful ministry of this church in Philadelphia was angering the people of the local Jewish synagogue. Now verse 9 suggests that the Christians in Philadelphia were suffering some kind of mistreatment at the hands of the members of the Jewish synagogue in that city. So verse 9 says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. It's again we hear we we see an echo of the uh, of, of the um, punishment of Shebna and the elevation of Eliakim in that, don't we? Uh, there's a trading of places there, a role reversal. The tables are turned by the gracious hand of our sovereign Lord Jesus. And it's very likely that some of the Christians had previously been members of that Jewish synagogue. They were Jews who had been in the synagogue at one point before they believed the gospel and, and decided to follow Christ. The scholars uh, Mounts and G.K. Beale uh, both raised the point that the local synagogue, and I'm quoting from Beale, claimed that only those worshipping within the doors of the synagogue could be considered God's true people and may have even excommunicated Christian Jews. So just think about that and imagine that that happened to you. You grew up in the synagogue. It was your community. Your friends and family and cousins and so on are in the synagogue. You share culture, you share memories, you share uh, a lifetime of, of uh, uh, positive events. And then you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, your Messiah, and you put your faith in him. And those very people that had always been part of your life, your loved ones, your closest friends, they cut you off. They excommunicate you. You are no longer welcome at their place of worship. Even though you've come to realize Jesus is the Messiah of the Jewish people. He is the Savior of Israel. And you want to share that with them, but they want nothing to do with you. You're done for them. You're dead to them. That would hurt. If following Jesus had got some of these believers not only thrown out of the community, out of the synagogue that they'd always known, but even got them rejected by their relatives and loved ones. But you see, the, the Christians here in this city still kept uh, God's word. They still hung on to God's word. They did not deny Jesus in spite of what it cost them. So again, look at verse 9. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. I love that. There's an odd little translation detail in verse 9 here. The New American Standard Bible, again, has a footnote that draws attention to this, this translation issue. In the original language, uh, verse 9 reads, Behold, I will give them from the synagogue of Satan. Uh, and a few words later, Behold, I will make them to come and bow down at your feet and know that I have loved you. Remember how I pointed out that uh, with the judgment on Shebna and the reward of Eliakim in Isaiah 22, God took what was Shebna's and gave it to Eliakim. And that idea was repeated. I take away his robe, give it to Eliakim. I take away Shebna's sash, and I give it to Eliakim. I take away Shebna's authority, and I give it to Eliakim. Well, here I think that's the point behind the wording in the original in verse 9 that the New American Standard captures well. Behold, I will give from the synagogue of Satan, and I will give it to you. I will take, and I, I think um, A.T. Robertson, I think, is the one who pointed out that uh, that he thinks Jesus is here predicting that he would take people from the synagogue of Satan and bring them to the church. And bring them to the church. That that Jesus will take Jewish, believe, Jew, Jewish unbelievers and turn them into Christian believers. This uh, gospel outreach of these believers will win over even some of their persecutors. And they will learn that I have loved you, says Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing grace? When the Lord takes those who mistreat you and opens their eyes and helps them to realize his love and then shows them that he loves you 
that it, it, that the Lord they they wanted to know is being has already saved you that you are his loved ones that you are precious to him the very ones they were persecuting they find out we're precious are we're precious all the time to God their God and Lord and and when the very people who mocked and ridiculed your faith end up coming to be discipled by you in that same faith do you see that this is the work of what verse 7 calls this is the work of the the holy one this is the work of the true one only he can do it this is the work of the one who has the keys of death and hades yes but who also has this key of david this is the work of the one uh, who who can open and shut gates so that even the gates of hell cannot stop the ministry of the church from bearing fruit when god is the one doing the work and his name is jesus christ the lord so how how should this first part of the letter to the church in philadelphia how should it change the way you pray today are there unsaved people you need to be praying for that you've you've been neglecting i know i have jesus can save them are you discouraged in your own efforts to share the gospel does it feel like that when you try to share your faith, when you uh, try to preach the word, even if you have opportunities to preach, does it share like when you have a chance to share and, and to teach someone something about the scripture or to help them understand why you serve and love Jesus Christ? Does it does it feel to you like you're just not effective, like it's discouraging, like no one's listening, like you you can't even put your words together? Well, the effectiveness, my friend, and the power of your ministry does not depend on you. It depends on Jesus. Jesus is the one who is able to place before you an open door. And no one will be able to shut it. So pray for opportunities to share. And then pray that nothing on earth will be able to close the doors that Jesus opens. Pray that Jesus will bring some people to, to discover that he loves you. To discover his love. And the same love that he has for you. And don't forget, that's the great motivation. It's not to see, it's not to see people uh, punished. It's not to see people get what they deserve. It's to, to find that people will come to know the love of Christ who has first loved us. Uh, this, is, this is our great motivation, to stay faithful, to keep the Lord's word, and to not deny his name. Let's pray. Father, I ask that this morning's uh, word would be that... Um, that flame that lights our hearts again, uh, that, Lord, we would be uh, so deeply encouraged and um, strengthened by this word so that in the times of discouragement, when it feels like our witness, that it feels like our ministry uh, seems to have little fruit, that you would remind us that, Lord, you are the Lord of the harvest. And as, as Jesus says in Luke 10, verse 2, Father, that you would put in our hearts a desire to pray, a desire to pray to the Lord of the harvest for workers, for laborers, for his harvest. Because the harvest is plentiful, but there's a shortage of labors. And so, Lord, would you cause us to pray not only for the effectiveness of our ministry, but for more to, sh to be active in that ministry, sharing the gospel. That, Lord, you would bring more people to love you, to discover your love, so that you raise up more people who can witness and share their trust and love for you. To share the faith that they have found in the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining me tomorrow. Uh, I'll do my best again to be back on Friday morning with another, uh, the second part of the uh, letter to the angel of the Church of Philadelphia. <laughs>